hear things like Singapore math doesn't really exist. Not in Singapore anyway. In, in Singapore, we do not call it Singapore math, we call it mathematics. <laughs> because there's nothing spectacularly different about this thing called Singapore math. Singapore math is just teaching mathematics according to pedagogy, according to research, according to learning theories, which should be the case in the first place. So there's nothing, nothing Singaporean about Singapore math, right? People begin to be quite interested in what we do because there are not many places around the world where mathematics instruction is pretty uniform across schools. But that's the case in Singapore. No matter which school you go to, no matter which classroom you visit, uh, it is basically the same thing. You cannot really tell that you are in this school or that school. It's pretty uniform. There are many reasons for it. One of the reasons is that we are 100% public school system, so no provision for private schooling, and all our teachers are trained at the same university. We are not a very big country, uh, five and a half million people, every cohort of students about 40,000. So it's not a very big system with about 150 rather large elementary schools. Uh, our schools are large. We have about 250 to 400 students per grade level. So that means you have several thousand students. Uh, in, in each school. So they are rather large schools, but only 150 of them. And people are also interested in Singapore math because it is an example of teaching and learning, because it's based on pedagogy, has managed to transform the learning of students. So students started back in the earlier days, uh, even as recent as the early 90s, not doing too well in mathematics. So uh, if you look at this table, which is a compilation done by Eric Hanushek and colleagues, these are economics professors at Stanford. Using the international scale, 500 would indicate adequate learning. So a score of 500 means students are on grade level. And a difference of 40 points is a difference of one year of learning. So, in this table that includes only the Asian countries that submitted samples over the years, there's a clear separation between systems that do rather well. Typically, they are East Asian countries in the northern part of Asia. We call it East Asia. Uh, those countries are typically six to eight hours by flight from Singapore. And then going down the list, you have countries that are within two hour flight radius from Singapore, Southeast Asian countries. So there's a very clear separation between East Asian countries and Southeast Asian countries. Even in the earlier years, when only a couple of countries submitted samples for testing, which is done once every few years, uh, the East Asian countries tend to score above 550. So if you remember, 500 is adequate, and 40 points is one year of learning, East Asian kids are typically one grade level above expectation. Whereas in Southeast Asia, where Singapore is, Philippines, Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore included in the early years, our students are struggling to reach 450. That means getting to the level which is one year below grade level, is already a struggle for our, our students, let alone getting to the target. And over the years, things are getting a bit unfortunate for some Southeast Asian systems. Uh, for example, in Indonesia and the Philippines, their score is typically in the high 300s, 400, for example, which means 100 points below. That will equate to two and a half years below expectation. So there is a very clear separation but Singapore, over the last few decades, has been an outlier. In fact, it is such an outlier that Malcolm Gladwell included Singapore in the book called Outliers. <laughs> it's not supposed to be doing well in, in education because we have a culture of 
teaching children that systematically make students not good in academic work. Three things in particular in relation to mathematics, rote memorization is pervasive in Southeast Asian classroom. We get our kids to memorize all kinds of stuff. So if you want to know the secrets to making students performing at a low level, I can tell you the secret. Rote memorization, doing procedures without understanding the meaning, and computation that are tedious and require paper all the time. Put it simply, uh, too much of paper and pencil calculation, especially those of the tedious kind, meaning those that doesn't lend themselves to mental strategies. Those are the three things that systematically make Southeast Asian students not do well in mathematics. So when Singapore started to remove those three things as early as 1980, but it took us a long time before we can even get it into the system, about 10 years, um, our students were not doing well. But once we managed to remove those three obstacles in a more systemic way, our students begin to perform much better, getting into at least 550s. Today's course is about what can we do in our lesson design and lesson de delivery to ensure that a lot of students get to the highest level of learning. Because today we know that it is possible it is possible to get a lot, a lot, a lot of students, even average learners, to perform at a pretty high level, indicative that the learning is quite deep. And through the lesson delivery portion of the course, hopefully we are able to go away with a collection of things, that routines that we can put in place to ensure an environment that is simultaneously safe and challenging. So how can we make that happen? So over, over the years, because we try to train our teachers not to do those three things and then do all the other things that we are discussing today, uh, our, our students are performing a lot better than before. For example, in the most recent measurement done in 2015, reported a year later, uh, Singapore students in grade 4 is at 618. That's about 120 points above expectation which translate into about three years, three grade levels above expectation. And similarly, in grade eight, it's about the same score, 621. The difference is not significant. So the kids have done a lot better than before, just by removing the three things that can sabotage the learning of students and then putting in whatever we are discussing today. Those things we are discussing today, I think will come to about five features of a lesson five learning experiences and four or five critical competencies. So that's our goal today, to get to those things. By the end of today, we should be able to say a good lesson that can promote deep learning uh, would have five features. And students will get about five experiences and that will lead to development of five critical competencies. All right? <laughs>